Hi, I'm Jody Delight from the University of Cape Town, and I'm going to present a paper that was co-authored with Ralph Hammond, also from the University of Cape Town, currently titled, When Identities Collide, How Founder Identities Emerge and Change. So this paper is based on a longitudinal study that was conducted in a place called Marsabit County, which is in northern Kenya towards the border of Ethiopia. It's an area comprised mostly of lowland scrub desert, interspersed with several mountain ranges and hills. It's Kenya's most arid area, and it's prone to increasingly severe droughts. It's a context of extreme poverty and high illiteracy. Many people live in clusters of small domed huts made of sticks, often covered with plastic sheets to protect them from the rain. So they often sleep on animal skins or grass mats, but some of them are now starting to purchase mattresses, which are a bit more comfortable for them. It's a predominantly pastoralist community that has no tradition of business. In fact, there aren't any words in the local language for business or for profit. And many people have had limited exposure beyond their nearest tiny market town. So to help alleviate poverty in these areas, development organizations have been implementing programs to provide pastoralists with basic business knowledge, skills, and resources to enable them to buy and sell items for revenue, calculate profit, save money, and access and repay loans with interest. So pastoralists are learning what it means to be a business person and new concepts and roles associated with business. So this was the perfect context to understand how founder identities emerge and change, particularly in a context of extreme poverty, and when their people are being introduced to new identity templates. So we followed 51 pastoralists over three years to understand how their perceptions and behaviors change over time as they learn about business, and more specifically, how founder identities emerge and change over time. And we did this through the lenses of social identity theory and role identity theory. So what we found was that people start with existing social and role identities that become salient to who they are as a founder. So in this context, there's an existing collectivist identity that's associated with values of mutual aid and generosity and an associated social safety net role identity where people are expected to share what they have with others. So for example, if all my livestock die in a drought and I have no food, it's expected that you'll share your food with me or maybe you'll loan me a goat or a camel and maybe I'll give it back to you when it has a baby and I'll keep the baby or maybe the debt will only be repaid in future generations. But as people were exposed to new identity templates associated with business, a conflict emerged between existent and new identities that were salient to being a founder. So for example, people learned about the roles of sales manager and financial manager, which are associated with behaviors of selling goods for profit, budgeting and saving money. But you can't sell goods for profit and save money and share everything you have with others at the same time especially in the context of extreme poverty where resources are severely limited. And we saw that people respond to the identity conflict in different ways. So some founders prioritize their exit identities over their new identities. So an example in this context is where founders share all their business goods with needy community members, even if it means their business fails over and over. So like this woman, Lol Tepes, for example, she explained some will take goods on credit and fail to return and others will pay. That's how our place is. If there's a poor person, you'll give them something. So she prioritizes her extant collectivist and social safety net identities over the new identities of sales and financial manager. She gives goods on credit, even if she knows people might not pay her back and she gives away business goods to help people. So founders who emphasize exit identities over the new identities follow a maintaining pathway and they become exit founders. So in this context, we refer to them as collectivist founders who embody exit values of mutual aid and generosity as an important part of who they are as a founder. So they run their business in a way that prioritizes helping others over business continuity, profit and savings. 
So we saw other founders emphasizing varying combinations of both extant and new identities. So take this man, Harisha, as an example. On one hand, he prioritizes his extant identities by sharing business goods with needy community members. So as he explains, there's a poor member of the community and you can't just tell her to go away without giving her something like 100 shillings so she can feed her children. You can also give food for the family. But now on the other hand, when it comes to goods on credit, he tries to limit how much credit he gives to maintain his business and generate profit and savings. And while he continues to loan money to needy community members, he's now learned about this concept called interest and has reframed the role of moneylender into a profit op opportunity by charging interest. So he says, you know, if someone wants a thousand shillings and when the market day comes and they sell livestock, they pay with an interest. Interest is a good thing. It's a good profit. So founders who emphasize some exit identities and emphasize some new identities follow the balancing pathway and become hybrid founders, which in this context means they try to juggle helping needy community members and maintaining and growing their business without necessarily optimizing either. So then there are some founders who shift emphasis completely to the new identities. So they might rank uh, new identities higher than the exit identities, or they might reframe exit identities in new ways, they might even decouple exit identities from who they are as a founder or even remove exit identities completely. So this woman, Nasanten, for example, continues to give goods on credit, but she only gives it to people who have a salary who will pay her back. So she says, look, I give them goods on credit to those people who have salaries because they'll pay me. I'll be able to buy new stock that way. So she gives goods on credit, but not just to anyone, only those that will pay her back because they have salaries. So the other thing that she does is she decouples some exit identities from who she is as a founder. So she still shares goods with needy community members, but only personal goods. She will not share any goods from her business. So founders who shift em emphasis completely to the new identities follow the transforming pathway to become new founders. So in this context, we refer to them as individualist founders who run their business in a way that prioritizes business continuity, profit, and savings over helping others. So now founders who follow the balancing or transforming pathways, they're deviating from existing values, norms, and expectations. So for example, community members were used to people sharing goods for free, and now they have to pay in some cases with added interest. They were used to borrowing livestock without specified deadlines, but now they're meant to repay an exact amount in a certain period of time. So they end up experiencing resistance from people in the community. So what they need to do is increase understanding and acceptance of their new behaviors and expectations, and ultimately change perceptions of who they are as a founder. And we found that founders engage in three mechanisms of external identity work in order to do this. So the first is explanation, where they try to explain how business works, why someone has to repay them, um, or the concept of interest and what it means and how it works and why people have to pay it. The second mechanism is enforcement. So this is where they might say, okay, look, you're not getting these goods unless you pay me back at this time and with this amount and with this interest. Otherwise, you're not, you're not getting anything. And the third mechanism is leveraging authority figures. And this is where they might use village elders or chiefs or even the police to reinforce their new behaviors and expectations. So the other question we asked ourselves is, why does a founder follow one pathway versus another? And while there may be a number of contributing factors, we found that other identities shape which pathway a founder follows. So for some founders, we found the exit identity is strongly internalized and very important, which leads them to maintain emphasis on the exit identity with respect to who they are as a founder. So going back to Lil Tepes as an example, she describes business as not very important and explains, you know, in our culture, we help each other. You will help those who are less fortunate while doing business. Right? So she maintains emphasis on her exit identities 
regardless of education and exposure to new identity templates because they're strongly internalized and very important for her. So in contrast, where the exigent identity is less internalized and important, founders are more likely to shift to the balancing or transforming pathways as they learn about the new identity templates. But the pathway they shift to and who they become as a founder is regulated by other salient identities. So for example, we found that founders with a curse believer identity follow the balancing pathway to become hybrid founders. So they believe if they don't share at least some of what they have with others, they'll be cursed and they might die. Going back to Harisha as an example, you know, he juggles his exit and new identities because he's a curse believer, right? So he explains you give them, you give needy community members 30 shillings to buy sugar so they don't curse you. You have to give them, you have to share. Other founders we found didn't believe in curses because they adopted a religious identity that negates the belief in curses. So that could be like a Christian identity, for example. Others had learned that through business education and exposure, curses don't apply to business. So if they don't share business goods with needy community members, people can try to curse them, but it's not going to work because they're, they're, they're allowed to maintain their business and generate profit and savings. So they have an adapted curse believer identity. So going back to Nasanten, who's a new founder, or we call her an individualist founder, you know, she explains, look, I'm afraid, but it can't be that way. You know, the person can't curse you just because you didn't do anything bad to them because you didn't give them goods on credit or hand out of business goods. So the pathway a founder follows and who they become as a founder is regulated by other identities. So how does this contribute to our theoretical understanding of entrepreneurship in context of extreme poverty and founder identity theory more broadly? Well, the burgeoning founder identity literature demonstrates that founder identities can be shaped by various forces and, include different, and can include differing constellations of both role identities and social identities that are salient for founders in their work and which shape founder behavior and ventures in diverse ways. But there's still little explanation as to the processes through which founder identities emerge and change, which is even more pronounced in contexts of extreme poverty where there's surprisingly little research on founder identity, yet a lot of emphasis on entrepreneurship as a solution to alleviate poverty. So our findings contribute to both the literature on entrepreneurship in contexts of extreme poverty and founder identity theory more broadly by explaining the process through which founder identities emerge when new identity templates are introduced. You know, this is through a process of identity conflict and the diverse responses to it. We also introduce regulating identities as an explanation for variance in founder identity change, and we bring external identity work to the fore as a key process in founder identity construction and change. So we also highlight important practical implica implications, particularly for development organizations that want to address poverty through entrepreneurship initiatives. So we highlight the importance of applying an identity lens to the study of entrepreneurship initiatives in context of extreme poverty to understand the micro-level enablers and barriers to entrepreneurship development and possible unintended negative consequences. And our findings point to the importance of being aware of and attending to exit identities and potential identity dynamics in the development and impl implementation of entrepreneurship initiatives in these contexts. So I hope you found this presentation and the paper interesting and insightful, both with respect to the context and theory. And we are very keen to get any feedback that you have, um, as well as answer any questions that you might have about the study or about the context. So please do um, make a comment or ask a question. And you're very welcome to send me an email as well.